I'm uh, so happy to introduce uh, uh, Professor Sally Benson. Uh, she is the Precode family professor and also the co-director of the Precode Institute for Energy at Stanford. Uh, Sally was also the director of Stanford's Global Climate and Energy Project. Uh, she is faculty in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering. I know we have a few students from Sally's department here. And uh, her research interests primarily are in the area of carbon capture, removal, storage, and management. Uh, she has been involved with Energy at, uh, you know, since its inception or even the, before that. So uh, she is the person in this room with the, with the most knowledge of Energy at. We are ce celebrating 10th year of Energy at running this year. Um, and um, I'm so thrilled to welcome you all. Uh, so with that, uh, Sally, it's over to you. All right. Okay. Anyway, awesome. uh, so terrific to have you all with us. Um, I'm so sorry we couldn't be together in person, but uh, I hope this will be a terrific introduction to um, energy at Stanford. Uh, as, uh, as Arpita said, I'm the <clears throat> co-director of the Precord Institute for Energy. Actually, today is my very last day and uh, this will be the uh, second to last official act as the uh, co-director of the Institute. Uh, but of course, I will be around and I really look forward to interacting with you uh, over the coming years. And what I would like to do in the short time we have together is to introduce you to the Global Climate and Energy Challenge. Now, I'm sure that all of you are uh, at experts at this in many ways, because obviously you chose to uh, come to this uh, workshop um, and also you're choosing to pursue your studies in this area. Um, but uh, I just thought it would be helpful to sort of get us uh, on the same page. But before we jump into that topic, I just want to show you this beautiful aerial uh, photograph of, of the Stanford campus. Uh, the uh, Normally, we would be uh, way across campus on this other side over here. We would be in the engineering quad. Uh, and I personally am in the, the Y2 IG2 building right now. And, uh, and I hope that over the next year or next, obviously not the next couple months probably, but after that, that we can get together and celebrate like we always do. Over 1,500 students have gone through the Energy at Stanford and Slack program, and our sincere hope is that uh, through uh, the En-ROADS project and, and other forms, uh, other times for networking, that you use this to build uh, friendships uh, that will stick with you your entire time at Stanford. You know, once you get into your own particular program, you'll be you'll have your department. Uh, the students in your department and so forth and the students in, in your research groups. Um, but this is a really great time to get to know people who are with a, a background entirely different than yours, but understanding that you all have the same common interest of energy. So, uh, so with that brief background, I just want to sort of lay out really what I think is the defining issue for your generation. And it's this dual challenge that we need more energy uh, and we need about two times as much energy as we have today. And at the same time, we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And at first, this may seem like a tremendous contradiction because today about 85% you know, of all the energy we use actually comes from fossil fuels, which of course, when we combust them, they emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So our challenge is to figure out how do we provide all the additional energy that we need and reduce emissions at the same time? And just to put a little bit finer point on the energy we need, uh, this is a map of electricity access and nearly 1 billion people or about one seventh of all the people on the planet don't have access to electricity today. Similarly, they don't have access to transportation fuels, you know, things that are so essential to modern life and, and allow us to be productive and comfortable and, and engaged with each other. So this is what uh, at least I spend all my time thinking about and then I hope that, that your passion for uh, addressing this dual challenge will grow uh, over your time at Stanford. So what I decided to do is to just sort of lay out so what I think of as big picture takeaways as we think about 
<clears throat> so we think about this dual challenge. And the first big picture takeaway is that we have a carbon budget that limits the acceptable emissions or the total amount of emissions that we can do before we are going to uh, have uh, too much warming. So, uh, so this is a graph that uh, IPCC developed. And, and for me, it's been one of the most instructive things for the way I think about the climate and energy challenge. So on the bottom axis, we have the cumulative emissions for carbon dioxide since, um, since we began to measure them in earnestness. And on the y-axis, we've got the temperature change uh, that is uh, that is uh, both been observed historically as well as the temperature change that we expect over time if we continue to add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So the simple way to read this is that if, for example, we want to limit warming to two degrees C, that we're going to have a, a budget, and that budget is indicated by this line here. Here's a 50-50 chance that we could keep warming below two degrees C. And if we, for example, want to limit warming to uh, with a 66% probability that we'll be below two degrees C, we have a budget of about 3,400 billion tons of carbon dioxide. And given that we've already emitted about 2,300 tons, uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide, that leaves a budget of 1,100 billion tons of CO2. Okay, so for me, this is useful because I'm you know, an engineer and, and I like to have targets. I know, like to know what I'm working for. Now, of course, if we wanted to limit warming to less than that, say to 1.5 degrees, uh, we would have even a, a much more stringent budget. Okay, so we have a budget. Now we know our target, at least if we want two degrees C, is uh, 1,100 billion tons of CO2 that we can emit before we're gonna go over two degrees C. Okay, so, uh, so how much time do we have to, uh, to do that? So today the emissions are about uh, 40 um, million, uh, 40, um, billion, 40 billion tons per year, okay? Um, and that's between agriculture and, and fossil, fuel, fossil fuel use. And if we were able to simply make sure that CO2 emissions didn't grow um, ever again in the future, uh, we would have 26 years before we were going to go through, blow through our budget. Okay, so, so that says this is a very urgent issue. We don't really have any time to waste. Um, if, however, we could uh, start decarbonizing at 1% a year, then we'd have 30 years, okay? We're buying a little bit more time by beginning to decarbonize uh, uh, the, the global energy system. If we can go to 2% a year, that gives us 37 years. If we can go to 3% a year, now we have 50 years, half a century. That starts making our job look a lot easier. And if we can simply begin to reduce emissions at a pace of 4% a year, we have over 100 years that we could, that we could uh, before we would have to get to carbon neutrality. So again, I like numbers. So for me, my target is to think about what set of actions could we take that will get us on a pathway where we're reducing emissions at about 4% a year. Okay, so that's the first thing. This, the second thing is that, uh, that uh, our fossil fuel-based energy system is largely responsible for climate change, okay? So we can't solve the climate and energy problem if we don't solve the energy problem. Okay, so here's a picture of the world energy mix, uh, about a little over 20% from coal, uh, about 40% from oil, about 35% from natural gas, uh, a little less than 10% for nuclear. And here we see the renewables on, on the top of the stack. Okay, so 82% from fossil fuels. And of course, we know the challenge is, is that when you combust fossil fuels, you make carbon dioxide and water, which leads to global warming. Okay, so we've got to solve the energy problem. We can't, vote. there are other important sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture is a big one, 
But if we don't solve the energy problem, we're not going to be able to solve the climate problem. So this is just some data that puts a little bit a finer point on this. Now these are the CO2 emissions. Okay, total CO2 emissions are about 42 billion tons per year. Uh, in the top, the gray line here, these are emissions from, uh, from uh, combusting fossil fuels. And on the bottom here are CO2 emissions associated with land use change. Okay, and land use change largely results from conversion of forest lands or grasslands to uh, agricultural lands. So again, <clears throat> emphasizing that we need to really go after emissions reductions from the electric or the energy sector. Okay, so the other thing is, is there are many options to decarbonize the energy system and we need all of them. Some of these options are conservation, you know, ride a bike, walk, wear a sweater, uh, simply use less energy by, by, uh, by behavior or personal choice. Uh, second thing we can do is efficiency improvements. Uh, I think the best example is that I can buy a car that gets 25 miles to the gallon. Uh, I can also buy a car that gets 50 miles to the gallon. So it's technological improvements make us use energy more efficiently. Uh, we can also switch from coal to natural gas. Now you might be going, why do we want to do that? Eventually we need to get to zero. Well, you know, certainly we do need to get to zero, but there are many parts of the world that are dependent on coal. And if they could switch to gas, emissions could be reduced by about 50% for CO2. Um, and uh, in addition, there are real benefits in terms of air quality. Third is we can switch to renewable generation or nuclear energy. So these are basically energy sources that don't rely on fossil fuel at all. And we'll talk more about uh, renewable, uh, renewable generation in particular. And then finally, for those areas where we can't uh, eliminate uh, the use of fossil fuels, at least over the next you know, several decades, that we can actually capture the carbon dioxide and we can pump it back underground where it came from in the first place. And, and the bottom line is that we need all of these. So one of the things that is, you know, over the past decade or so, there's been so much enthusiasm for uh, renewable generation in particular, that we've kind of forgotten that energy efficiency is really the workhorse of reducing uh, emissions. Basically, by energy efficiency improvements, we can reduce the amount of energy we need, and every, every bit of energy we don't use uh, is uh, that much closer to the solution. And so these work, and, and they're needed. And this is just a, an interesting graph. So this is looking at the annual per capita uh, energy use uh, for different parts of the world. Uh, so here you can see the average in the world is about 70 gigajoules per person. Um, and China uh, increasing to nearly 100 gigajoules a person. Here's the United States, okay? Really large per capita energy use. Here's the EU and, and here's India. So you say, well, you know, are people in the US living that much better uh, than they are in the, in the EU? Or is it simply that some societies, like the United States in particular, are particularly inefficient? So one way we can get some insight into this is to take a look at uh, this graph, which shows the energy per capita in gigajoules per person versus something called the Human Development Index. And the Human Development Index is something the U United Nations developed to try to characterize well-being. And it involves uh, health, uh, basically longevity. Uh, it involves a uh, level of education, as well as the, um, the, the wealth. So it's, a not, it's not purely a financial <clears throat> metric. It, it actually measures other important uh, societal indicators of well-being. And one of the interesting things we can see is that if you look that the, uh, the, the Human Development Index increases dramatically and quickly uh, as you go from uh, say 0.4 to, uh, to 0.8, as you go from zero to 100 gigajoules per capita. 
But beyond this, if you look at all these countries stretched out here, what we can see is there's really very little benefit in terms of well-being for more intensive energy use. So from my perspective, this creates the challenge is how can we as a global society try to evolve towards a point where we're in the range of 100 gigajoules per, per person. And actually, this is the number when I said we were going to need twice as much energy, uh, that's predicated on the, on the world moving to a place where everybody has access to about 100 gigajoules per person. So we have a lot of people who need a lot more energy, but we have a lot of people who can reduce their energy use. Okay, next, a reason for enthusiasm and hope that renewable energy is abundant, cheap, and growing rapidly. So this is a, a chart that basically shows what is the size of these renewable generation resources compared to how much energy humans use. Okay, so if, if the number is one, this says the energy resource would be exactly the same size as uh, human energy consumption. So for example, hydropower. If we used all the hydropower in the world, it would just about meet our demand. Okay, that doesn't mean it would be cost effective or economical or even environmentally sound to do that, but that gives you a point of reference. So a couple of things to look at. If we look at the solar and wind resource, they are enormous. The solar resource is about 6,000 times bigger than, than humans use or would need. Uh, wind about 70 or 80, 80 times. So very, very big resources. And the second one that's quite interesting is terrestrial biomass. Now, clearly it's not very much bigger than, than human energy consumption. On the other hand, it's been used for uh, throughout human history. Uh, and it's also something that we know how to use it. We can use woody products. Uh, we can also uh, make things like ethanol. So it's likely that the terrestrial biomass is also going to play uh, an important role, particularly for things like making fuels. Okay, so what about costs? I, I said that the, 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 they're cheap. Uh, and here's some data. These are levelized cost of electricity. And if we look at photovoltaics, you can see that uh, um, in about a decade ago, they were actually really pretty expensive, okay? So the cost of, uh, for example, coal generation or uh, natural gas generation is here at about $50 per megawatt hour down around here. And what we can see is the cost of solar energy has dramatically declined and it's, it's about the same cost as, as uh, traditional generation, onshore wind, uh, offshore wind, uh, even battery storage rapidly decreasing uh, towards uh, parity. And this is a, a, a new map that uh, Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance has prepared, which basically says what is the cheapest source of new bulk electricity generation for different countries. If you look at the United States, onshore wind, uh, if you look at uh, places like, uh, like China, um, utility scale solar. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so you can see much of the world, actual renewable generation is the cheapest form of electricity. That's not true everywhere. We can see that in uh, places like Russia, um, it's still natural gas. And there are some parts of the world uh, where, where uh, coal is cheaper. But a decade ago, this would have been inconceivable. However, just because renewable generation uh, is inexpensive and renewables are abundant, doesn't mean that we've solved all the problem. That high penetration of renewable energy on electrical grids ch creates challenges with operations. And this is a very famous curve, probably most of you have seen it. We call it the duck curve in, in uh, California. So the idea of it looks like a duck, this is the duck's head and this is the beak and this is the belly of the duck here. And, and the challenges are associated with, you know, we have to at every moment in time balance energy supply and demand. And historically we did that because we could turn on and off uh, generators and the operators of the grid understood the patterns of use very well. And so they could do this extremely reliably. But in the future, we want to rely much more on solar. We want to rely more on wind. And it turns out those, of course, aren't predictable. 
we can only have solar when the sun's shining and wind when the wind's blowing. And, and so there's a question of, you know, how do you build a system that's reliable? But there are also challenges, for example, with certain parts of the day, like when the sun goes down, and it also turns out to be the time when there's peak energy demand. Okay, so this is the, here is the total energy demand. And so you've got a major source of power generation going away, demand is increasing, so you rapidly have to do something. And uh, in California, what we do now is we turn on our gas plants and turn on our imports, but there are gonna be limitations to how quickly and reliably can, we can do this. So energy storage is certainly going to be important, um, but, uh, but it remains a very significant challenge. Okay, so what can we do about this? Well, there are a variety of approaches uh, for managing uh, renewables integration. Uh, we can add natural gas. Uh, natural gas is very flexible for turning on and off. Uh, we can make sure that our renewable generation are diversified so that we have lots of different sources. We've got wind and solar and hydro and bio because the more you have, the easier it is to manage this balance. Uh, we can control uh, when and where people use electricity to make the to, to make both the demand for, uh, flexible as well as the generation flexible. We can charge different amounts of an, uh, for electricity when uh, supplies are abundant, make it more expensive when they're scarce. We can integrate the area over which we're um, uh, bringing in renewables to the grid. So just because the sun might not be shining in California, maybe it is shining in Arizona, uh, similar with wind. So wide area integration of markets. And of course, energy storage is, uh, is an important technology. So, uh, so uh, here we can see, uh, this is uh, lithium ion batteries. Again, prices have really plunged uh, uh, dramatically and are expected to continue to drop. But lithium ion batteries are largely used for short-term storage uh, on the order of four hours. And long-term electricity storage really remains an unresolved challenge. I, I really think of this as a kind of the holy grail if we can get to long-term electricity storage uh, where we have weeks of storage or even we can store energy over the course of a season. That will really help us increase the uh, generation from renewables. Uh, and things like hydrogen are exciting options for being able to do that. But some emissions are hard to eliminate re with renewable energy. Uh, here's an example of some, uh, things like shipping, aviation, long distance road transport, um, making iron and steel, making cement, um, and then what we call load following electricity. Uh, getting to 100% renewable energy ge electricity generation is, is really tough uh, because um, you need to end up overbuilding the system, which becomes very, very costly. So there'll be a certain amount of, of uh, fossil generation, at least in the short run, that is likely to be necessary to get to, to, uh, to keep the reliability. So this is about 9 billion tons a year, or 25% of global emissions are hard to eliminate without a technology called carbon capture and storage. So again, the, this is one of the areas that I work on extensively. The idea is here is that you capture carbon dioxide from a power plant, you can compress it, uh, transport it, and then pump it uh, back underground into an oil reservoir, gas reservoir, or even put it just in a very salty water uh, filled formation. Uh, today, there are uh, over 19 projects uh, operating, capturing about 30, uh, 39 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. It's been growing steadily at about a pace of 10% per year. It's not nearly fast enough, but, uh, but it is starting to, to make some headway. So, so the final sort of big picture takeaway is that we need a comprehensive, deliberate, and integrated plan if we're going to be successful in uh, achieving emissions reductions at the needed rate of about 4% per year. So the way I think about it is, you know, we need twice the current energy use if we can't be, uh, with, if we're all having 100 gigajoules per person. 
if we could even conserve more, if we could improve energy efficiency, maybe we can get that down to say 1.6 times current energy use. We need to think about things like switching from coal to gas, switching to renewable energy, uh, electrifying vehicles, huge potential for efficiency improvements and uh, getting rid of tailpipe emissions and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, carbon capture and storage, nuclear, and of course, there are going to be new technologies that emerge, and I hope many of you are going to be working on them uh, because we, uh, this is a, a strong portfolio, but we do need more. Um, but this isn't just about technology. We need the enabling infrastructure, so grid modernization and vehicle charging. We need to have techno-economic analysis to help make sure that we're making good energy choices as we go along this journey to decarbonize. We need policy and finance support, an example being a revenue neutral carbon tax that will uh, incentivize companies to begin that journey of decarbonization. And of course, at the end of the day, it's really gonna be behavior and public opinion that uh, allow everybody to get on board and make the necessary changes to achieve these emissions reductions. So we have a portfolio of solutions where everybody contributes uh, and it's not just technology. And in my last little few minutes, I just wanna say a little bit about Stanford's uh, central energy plant. Uh, about eight years ago, we began to uh, dismantle our existing natural gas fired power generating station. We decided to buy a lot of renewable generation and by 2022, we'll be at 100% renewable generation. But we also did a, a really radical experiment and transformed the entire heating system to electricity. And when you're back on campus, uh, I hope you can go visit the central energy plant, uh, but it allows a much more efficient system uh, and a total of 80% carbon emission reductions from the campus and also less water use. And one of the fantastic things is that uh, a number of students have been working very closely uh, with, the, with the central energy operations. And really, I'd like you to think about Stanford campus as a living lab where there are opportunities for you to do research. And here's just a picture from an aerial picture. And one of the keys to what made this system work is massive energy storage. So when we think about energy storage, we think about battery storage, but the reality is, is we can also store heat. Uh, and uh, here are these, uh, you can see these, here's the cars, so you can see just how enormous these are. We have two cold storage tanks and one hot storage tank. And this is what stores all the hot and cold water that runs in a loop around the campus and, uh, and provides all of our heating and cooling. So, uh, that's what I wanted to say today, but I, I do uh, want to let you know about the classes I teach. Uh, in the fall, I teach uh, Energy 153, 253, Carbon Capture and Storage. Love to see you there. Um, we're also teaching a carbon dioxide removal research seminar. This is a one unit class. Uh, take a look if you're interested. Um, in the winter, uh, we have a hydrogen research seminar, which is really interesting. Uh, and then in the spring, I teach uh, a class called Sustainable Energy for Nine Billion. So I hope to see you in class and thank you. And I really look forward over the coming years to getting to know you and welcome to Stanford. Thank you, Sally. That was wonderful. Thank you for setting the stage for us and for highlighting the big takeaways that we should keep in mind as global citizens as we work on the energy problems. Somebody was asking about the central energy facility tours. Uh, I know that their team is working on setting up some online tours and uh, you know, once the campus opens, uh, they will be doing in-person tours also. So we will keep you guys posted when we learn more. Hi, Sally. Um, I have a question about the uh, carbon um, budget you were talking about. And uh, I just wanted to understand the scale of what a 1% reduction would look like or you know, one, two, three, four. Um, like, have we achieved something along those, like a 1% reduction before, or are we still at very much close to zero? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, actually, carbon dioxide emissions have been going up a, a couple percent per year. 
So, so getting to you know, even flat will be a, a big job. Getting to minus 1% is, is an even bigger one. So minus 4% is a big job. But if you think about pursuing this portfolio of options all at once, instead of doing it sequentially, if we're more efficient, if we're conserving, um, at least I know in my own personal life, I think I could easily uh, reduce uh, my emissions at, at, uh, at, at that pace. And, and I think that many other could, if we just pay attention to it, set our mind to it, and you know, put, uh, put our, our action where our words are. I think Siddharth raised his hand. Uh, Siddharth, go ahead and ask your question. I'll request you to say your name and your department uh, so that we know uh, who you are. Perfect, thank you. So I'm Sid, you can call me Sid, I'm at the GSB and I'm an incoming student as well. Uh, so I actually, I'm a dual degree student at the Kennedy School at Harvard and I spent the summer looking at energy efficiency investments in the US and the sort of cost effectiveness of that. So I was wondering what you thought of energy efficiency on one hand versus just driving down the cost of renewables and generation on the other. Because one of the findings just from looking at the literature, we didn't do any original research of our own was uh, it's not tremendously cost effective to subsidize residential energy efficiency. I, I totally agree with you. I think on a personal level, it's possible to reduce it, but from a sort of government policy standpoint, the sort of dollar cost per ton of CO2 is in the hundreds of dollars. Um, and there may be cheaper ways of getting to the same result if we you know, decarbonize the electricity supply more quickly. So I was just wondering, where you think the balance of effort should lie between those two things. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, it, it depends on the, um, you know, the type of efficient, efficiency improvements. You know, some efficiency improvements actually, uh, you know, pay back. Uh, so things like, you know, switching to LED lighting uh, can, can actually pay you back. Um, buying a car that's uh, much more efficient as long as it's not a premium car. Um, you know, that can actually make you money. But, the, but you're right, there are many other things like uh, structural things like putting in new windows or putting in um, uh, insulation where, uh, you know, it, it is quite expensive. So from my perspective, you know, none of this is going to come free that, you know, we're going to have to pay, you know, just like when we decided that we were not going to throw trash out, you know, the window and, you know, have it pile up on the streets, you know, we pay for that. Uh, just like we, um, you know, waste water. Uh, we don't uh, let that run freely into rivers. We, we uh, you know, send it to sewage treatment plants. So, you know, this is not going to come for free. But if you look at, say, equivalent of $100 per ton of CO2, uh, that's uh, in the United States, as an example, that's corresponding to like 2.5% two, two of GDP uh, is, is comparable to $100 per ton. So, you know, yes, it's a lot of money looked at one way, but another way it really isn't, doesn't look like that much, particularly when you consider the benefits of, of uh, stabilizing the climate so that we don't have to deal with massive sea level rise, uh, you know, continued uh, extreme weather um, and, and so forth. Great, thank you. It's uh, Mayan Gerda from uh, the GSV. I'm an incoming Sloan Fellow. Um, and my question is on carbon capture. Um, and I just wanted to say, I'm not an expert in that domain, but just doing some research. Are there different types of carbon capture and some which are more permanent and some which are more temporary in their methodology of sinking carbon that we need to be careful about when we, when we look at them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, yes, there are. So if, for example, you convert carbon dioxide to uh, a mineral, uh, then that's going to be permanent. If you pump CO2 back underground into an oil reservoir or, or a saline formation, uh, that too you know, is essentially permanent. If on the other hand, you uh, grow a forest and then a forest fire comes along, um, that's not gonna be permanent. If you uh, change your agricultural practices to, uh, to increase the soil carbon, uh, and you might build up soil carbon, but if a, the farm changes hand and somebody comes and tills up that soil again, all that carbon could be released. So, so the, the biospheric solutions tend to be less permanent than the geologic ones is the way I think about it. And just in terms of the technology, the technological carbon capture that we're now seeing, including direct 
air capture. How should we think about that in the same way? Should we be more skeptical about certain methods and mm -hmm. more supportive of others? Yeah, so direct air capture, um, as is envisioned, there are like three major companies. You know, it's an engineered solution. Um, and it's basically very similar to uh, carbon capture that would be used on a concentrated point source. There are solvents uh, that, that capture the carbon dioxide. And, um, and the way I think about direct air capture is compared to, for example, capture on a point source. Uh, typically on point sources, concentrations are say between five and 100% CO2. Whereas in air, you know, it's a tiny fraction of what that would point, point, uh, point oh four percent, for example. So in one case, we've already done part of the work for us to concentrate the CO2. So it requires much less energy than if we try to capture carbon dioxide directly from air. So to me, that's the, that's the big difference. I don't think that, uh, you know, other than cost and efficiency, I don't think there's a big difference between them. Uh, they both sort of achieve the same result. You know, one takes carbon out of the air, the one, another one avoids it going in the air in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. And then both of them take that carbon dioxide. Well, if, if it's carbon capture and storage, both of them would, for example, put the carbon uh, back underground as the, the sort of dominant technology today.